Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar today, How Can You Calculate the Cost of Your Data, sponsored by Paxata. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Michelle Getz. Michelle comes to Paxata with over 20 years of experience in marketing, data management, and analytics. Previously from Forrester Research as principal analyst, she was one of the most thought-out analysts leading research on data management and artificial intelligence, helping leading enterprise organizations and government agencies define their strategies, best practices, data governance programs, and technology decisions. Most notably, Michelle championed research on data preparation solutions and practices. And with that, I will give the floor to Michelle to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Thanks for having me today. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to talk about how you can calculate the cost of your data. Um, we're always looking to maximize the value that we get from our data. We're looking to get better insights, how we can improve our operational efficiencies, and how we can grow our businesses. So as we look at our data, we're really thinking about, you know, what does it look like to manage it appropriately? How do you handle the quality and trust of that information? And how can you be efficient and effective in, in doing so? Well, let's start off with, you know, what does great data look like? What does it help you do? And we're all very familiar with the airline industry, and we all know that we're continuously shopping around for the best price on our seats. But the prices on seats are always this ambiguous black box. You don't quite know what the price is going to be. You don't understand from day to day how it's necessarily going to fluctuate. And you can certainly be sitting next to somebody who has um, purchased that seat for more and le or less than you or not paid anything at all for that price. Well, it's not by accident. It's because the airline industry out of years of pressure, first from deregulation and then pricing wars, had to figure out a better way to be competitive in the market or go under. We've seen, a, you know, certainly during the 90s and early 2000s, a number of airline uh, companies just really not being able to survive, particularly as there were a lot of price wars coming up from, you know, a, a number of upstarts um, in the industry. And so what did they do? They turned to their data and they said, what do we know about our travelers? What do we know about the prices that they'll pay for our seats? What do we know about their booking habits? And what do we know about the places that we fly to and where people are interested in? And there's also a number of, you know, inf pieces of information that can be organized within this analytics, but at the end of the day, what it helps them do is introduce dynamic pricing. And this is where they can be competitive, and this is where they can survive, but also where they can grow and offer other types of offers and packages and even other uh, travel experiences that you might not have expected before. So certainly analytics was the powerhouse behind this, but at the same time, the data had to be trustworthy so that they could rely on the analytics. And at the end, you know, so let's just take a look at this. Um, you know, if you think about what they've been able to achieve, are you able to demonstrate business ROI, um, you know, from the investments in your data, or is it inhibiting it? So I thought we would turn this over to a poll, and Shannon, if you could help me out here so that people can participate, and I'll give just a minute. Oh, give me, give me just a minute here, Michelle, working on getting that for you. No problem. So while she's getting that together, you know, one of the things that has always been fascinating to me is to see how do organizations go about actually, um, you know, determining the ROI. How do they make decisions um, about their data investments, and, and what are the business cases that are being put together? And we find a, a, a range of how organizations go about it. It could be that it's loosely tied to initiative 
there's a there's a reason to you know find to recognize that by reinvesting in new um, and modern capabilities, you can reduce your costs. Um, but usually, some of the more tangible ways of identifying, um, you know, ROI are, are often hidden. It, it can it can certainly be a challenge. Um, let's see how we're doing here right now. So I think we've had enough time, Shannon. Maybe we can take a look at the results. Seems like we're having a little bit of a challenge with the with the polling right now. So I'm just going to move along. Oh, and maybe actually, it's going. Oh, you got it. It's going right now. It's just closing it's right now. It? Sorry, okay. Michelle. Yeah, That's it's okay. going, closing right now. We've had some last second uh, answers coming in, and it is um, closing and submitting. And I will push the results here as soon as that is done. We have some Jeopardy music. <laughs> there we go. Oh, to see that. So, yeah. So it looks like a number of you are definitely saying no. It, it, it's really hard to demonstrate ROI, and and that's pretty typical of what I've seen. You know, there's there's an understanding to, about where you want to invest data and in, and what area of the business you might want to be supporting, but nobody's really put hard metrics to that. Um, and it, and it's always you know even after the fact, trying to measure that is often very difficult. But hopefully as we move forward, I can give you some things to be thinking about. And even if you can't get to the point where you can have the hard numbers or all of the facets that go into this, at least hopefully I'm giving you a model and something to think about um, as you're building your cases for more investment within your data. Um, you know, certainly having, um, you know, to, had conversations with Gartner and looking at some of their research, what we're finding is, you know, by 2017, 33% of the largest global companies will experience an information crisis due to the inability and inadequate value to govern trust and trust their enterprise information. That's actually a really large number. 33% of companies are going to have challenges around that. And it really points to the fact that, you know, we don't fully have our arms around the way that we manage data today. Certainly within pockets of the organization, if you're in financial services or another highly regulated environment, um, there, are, um, there are efforts underway to ensure that you have strong management governance and, and quality uh, practices in place. But other areas around um, maybe customer experience or logistics or inventory management, you know, some of the other operational areas of your business, um, or some of the transactional areas of your business aren't necessarily as well governed. And certainly within areas within your organization where you're doing much more exploration and discovery for your analytic habits, um, you know, not everything has been, you know, put under a governance um, policy and you're having to really play in the data to understand, you know, uh, the meaning of it and understanding, you know, the value or even the risk around those things. There is so much data coming into our organizations today, it truly is difficult to have a handle on all of that. And we're working in, in a uh, state where it's probably a little bit more chaotic than, you know, what we've been used to, you know, in the past, and we have to come up with new practices to accommodate that. So where are some of these areas that organizations are, are feeling the impact, either through lack of governance or transparency or just challenges in, in generally managing information? I mean, certainly there's missed revenue opportunities because maybe you're not using all of the information that's available to you to have the most complete insights um, to make decisions. There's customer churn for, you know, some very similar reasons where you might not be able to see across the different interaction points that you have with customers engage what those experiences are. Um, inaccuracy and forecast certainly occurs um, by maybe, you know, missing pieces of information, inability to gather information in or account for a lot of the dynamic changes that might be happening in, in the marketplace, either in, in general macroeconomic senses or even in micro and competitive scenarios. Um, certainly we see aspects 
um, a fraud, which has been, you know, at, at the top of mind in our um, in the news of late, and compliance has already always been um, available. Certainly within the retail space or any other um, manufacturing or industrial type of organization, managing of inventory um, is, is, you know, has a strong emphasis on it right now, and being able to have sort of just in time inventories and just in time fulfillments. Um, kind of go along with that. So, you know, tying the inventory and your logistics and fulfillment together is really top of mind. And you see companies like Kohl's and Walmart and Lowe's with, you know, um, ship to store upon um, upon orders coming in and so so forth. And lastly, oftentimes what we're not really thinking of, uh, about and quantifying is is the lack of worker productivity. What happens when workers don't have the right information in front of them? What happens when that information might be inaccurate? Or what happens if it just takes a long time to bring that information together? So there's a wide variety of areas where, you know, data can slip through the gaps and cause some of the challenges that Gartner has talked about earlier. And so on the flip side, you know, when we turned to Forrester and, and took a look at what they were talking about, you know, that Noel really brought up a very interesting point where, you know, too often you're looking at um, your investments in, in data, and here he's talking about big data projects as more of a bottom-up type of approach where you're looking at a variety of data sources, then bringing them together. You don't always have an understanding of what you're trying to do or achieve with that data. The ultimate goal is this is information that people feel is important, and at least we should bring it all to the same, you know, to the same place. But with a goal in mind, with an understanding of how that data is going to be used, that can actually change the shape of the information that becomes meaningful in the context of the types of insights that you're going to derive, of the types of decisions you're going to make, and of the types of outcomes that you're anticipating. And so when – oops, sorry, I hit the wrong number. And so what does this really look like? You know, one, one of the areas is a recognition of – when you start with a bottom-up approach that is, you know, loosely or, you know, at least, you know, there's aspirations to be linked and improving the business, but in the end, that doesn't actually pan out. And there's really a lost time to business ROI in that type of scenario. Go back a few years and think about how we made investments within um, our big data environments. And, and one example is a big box retailer who was standing up a Duke distro. Um, and really it was about modernizing the data center and accelerating integration. It was how do you handle the volumes of information that are coming in and reducing the cost and, and, and you know, avoiding those costs that come in from, um, you know, from a lot of the integration capabilities that are required or the resources that you're trying to bring in to go through that type of migration. And so in the end, they might have saved on their uh, warehousing costs by moving over to a Hadoop distribution. But in reality, the business ROI that should have been achieved from it, from it took a long time. It took 18 months before they were able to identify a, a use case within a specific business unit to be able to run a, even a pilot to understand what that is. They eventually found um, scenarios within a scenario within loyalty analytics and being able to customize offers. And certainly once those were put into place within a matter of weeks, those pilots were proven out and they were moving to scale. But in the grand scheme of things, it took two years just to take that one pilot and put it into a mass production. So if you think about the fact of, you know, migrating over, you know, from a, a higher cost heavyweight system to a lower cost, more agile system like a distro, and then having to go find your business cases, have you really proven out the ROI there? Or are you still, you know, kind of creating this pent up business debt because you haven't been able to really roll out the capabilities that are available? And then when somebody comes back to say, well, where have you been spending your money and why are you asking for more? It's a really hard conversation when you say, well, I did it in the interest of improving the total cost of ownership within my data center, but in the end, they're having a hard time how, seeing how that's relating to where their business objectives come. And so really what we've, we've been doing is setting up pipelines that are really designed for our systems and not thinking about the people. The, you know, we talk about this idea of going from raw data into information all the time. 
if you really take a hard look at it, though, we are surrounded by information today. That information comes from our conversations, our relationships, our experiences. There's already a rich set of context around that information sharing and, and creation. But how, how do you harness that at scale? And that's when it has to be, you know, brought into our data centers and our systems, and we feed that. In that process, we have to deconstruct that information, um, creating a lot of metadata um, around that. We are disassociating information, particularly if you think about relational databases. You're carving up blocks of, of information and putting them into a, a structure that, while it has a certain amount of, you know, has a certain semantic element to it, it's still, you know, very, um, you know, very siloed. So we're breaking that down, and we might become even highly atomic in, in that information as we further decompose that and optimize that data in a physical state that our systems can process and be highly responsive to and have a high performance for when requests for that information comes together. As we process this data, that deconstruction, the disassociation, and creating this atomicness of our data strips away a lot of the meaning that was originally in place when we started with that rich data. And this has really been where the crux of our challenges have been when um, trying to handle data and, and getting the most value out of it. Um, you know, we, we had a conversation recently with one of our um, financial services customer, and, you know, they, they really put it into great words, and I thought I would share this with you. You know, they, they talk about, um, you know, traditional tools requiring a lot of installation and setup time. It just takes so long, and, you know, how do you work on full, large volumes of data? Um, you know, sometimes when you have to go through your analytics, you don't want to be sampling. You need to look at everything, and certainly if you're in um, regulated environments, looking at everything is required um, to, to accommodate any of those risk, risks in the data that you have to, to take care of. Um, you know, going back to what we talk about, about, you know, going from rich information and processing, that software development life cycle is, you know, it, it is really sort of detaching our information, you know, our information um, and, and making it very raw. And it goes, you know, so you're writing a lot of code, you're doing a lot of packaging and then running it. And, you know, it's, it's creating an environment where you are disassociating even your business users from their data to the point where they don't necessarily feel all the time that they own their own information and that they should be accountable for it. And they're abdicating that responsibility to you in the IT department. Um, you know, and, and one of the things that's really kind of uh, important to recognize here is the business has to work with the data. They have to, they have to see it. They have to play with it. They have to understand it themselves, put it back into context and in creating those walls and barriers, make it a little difficult because they can't see it. And if they do need to, to get into it, they're not able to get into it quickly. So the time to query is very slow or even working on the masses of data and the, the volumes of data that we have today. Our systems really aren't um, designed and weren't designed to kind of handle those. And there's a certain amount of repeatability that they want. Um, you know, if you're preparing data within an Excel spreadsheet, all of those uh, data preparation steps are never even captured. And so every time you go back and go to another data set, you have to make those changes again and reshape your data. And obviously, you know, sometimes it's not that easy. Um, to make changes to the data. Um, you know, again, you're writing SQL scripts, you might be doing some, you know, Python scripting, there's a lot of coding you're building, um, you're building data integration workflows and things of that nature. And so there, there's no warm, fuzzy feeling when it comes to data. And, you know, part of that is that, you know, we, we built systems in an era that it could handle lower volumes and really was focused on transactional information. And in our modern environment, we're really dealing with a different beast when it comes to handling information and being able to harness everything. So before we move on, I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, as we've talked about some of these barriers and even some of the opportunities, like what, um, what are your big, biggest challenges when it comes to preparing da data? So I'll give you a a few seconds, about 15 seconds, to kind of um, answer this poll as Shannon gets that up.
I apologize, Michelle. I don't have the options for that one. Oh, you don't have the options for that one? Oh, no. okay. Well, then, all right. They were in the stream, I but we'll just move up. forward. Don't worry about it. Not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> we're flexible. <laughs> we'll just keep moving on. <laughs> um, so let's let's get down to this. How do we... Um, how do we get a handle on our data? How, how do you cross that out? How do you align um, the way that you manage that information, the way that you use that information to the value that can be achieved? So I want you to think about your data management strategy and how you right fit this. Um, and, and the way that I kind of look at it is across sort of four different areas. Certainly there's the amount of data being used. And what does that represent? It represents not only the fact that you have, um, you know, you have access to the information that you need, and it's it, it's the information that's meaningful, but also the fact that you have the opportunity to extend beyond that, so that as your environment changes, you have the ability to more easily incorporate more and more information, but at the same time, you also have the ability to dispose of information that while at one point it may have been meaningful and useful, it may not be that way anymore. And so, you know, access is, is a big deal. And most organizations today are really relying on only about 20% or less of the information or data that's in their, you know, in their systems, um, and while well, and certainly um, that while there's an eye to gathering more um, public and premium data, um, we're just in the beginnings of doing that. So for the most part, you know, data and data use cases are really um, uh, defined by a lot of the transactional information that we have today, and that's manifested obviously within our our BI systems or our, trans our transactional and application environments. So the other area that we look at is data interaction. Uh, you know, how accessible is this information? How, how available um, is this information? And, and is it easy for your business analysts and business users to get, um, get to the data and, and the frequency of how they get to that data? Certainly, we also want to look at levels of accountability. Who really owns this information, or who is who is taking um, the the most responsibility and, and accountability for this information on a day to day basis? Is this your IT organization where they're really you know bringing in that transactional information and managing the the data center and warehouses and the BI environments that build out you know large scalable repeatable types of um, uh, 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 capabilities, or is it business-driven where it might be, you know, having to look at something new or, uh, or starting to incorporate other types of analytic capabilities? And in the end, the fourth area or fourth dimension you want to be looking at is that time to first value. When do you get to act upon that information and have an impact and an effect on your business? with your customers and your ability to perform and be competitive within the marketplace. Now, why do I look at these four dimensions? I think what's really important to recognize is that oftentimes when we think about data, particularly in a governance perspective and, and when quality of that information has to, you know, really be focused upon, we, we start accounting for metrics that tend to look at only what is the completeness, what is the accuracy, what is the consistency of that data, those types of dimensions. We're measuring um, sort of data hygiene. And measuring of that data hygiene does, you know, acts as an indicator of will that data have value or not. But the, really the way we should be thinking about it, and, you know, it's, it's extend beyond um, beyond the quality components, and I would say even extending beyond the um, IT total cost of ownership components, taking in the business context, the who's using that information, and that business time to value. Those are really the two dimensions that are often missing in the way that we're really quantifying that data. So in the end, if you see how I've mapped this out, as you start to use more and more data, as you have the business being more and more uh, involved in using that data and in getting their, you know, first eyes on it and their hands on it to shape it the way that they need, 
um, you know, the, the interaction is obviously increasing, and obviously that takes, you know, you have a faster time to value. So the new types of capabilities that you want to introduce around exploration and discovery, a lot of the data mining efforts that you may be doing, or if you want to take steps into prescriptive analytics to make you more competitive, you know, on strategic and growth objectives, this is where, you know, you're, you're going to want to start mapping out your metrics to help you understand are you going to attain those goals. So with those dimensions, what does that look like? I don't have everything here, but I wanted to provide some things um, to kind of think about at a, at a high level. And certainly for your business, it's going to be a bit more unique depending on the analytic or operational types of activities you're going to perform, as well as the fact that you have different types of, of goals that are, um, you know, that, that are going to contribute to a lot of the business outcomes that you're measuring towards. So obviously first at any top of the model, what are you trying to do? Position towards a particular business outcome. What does that particular business outcome look like? When we talk about first time, you know, time to first business value, it's what is your upside? Did I improve my strategic position? So have I something like, you know, developing a new business model and extending a portfolio? Have I done something to improve my growth? So the way that I've improved the, um, the value or my net promoter scores with my customers. Um, the other, or is it a de-risking factor? Do I need to be thinking about how I'm solving against, you know, regulatory requirements? Do I need to be looking at where the quality of information is creating bottlenecks in my business processes? or things of that nature. So always look at upside and the risk factors and don't just rely on the risk factors because even in instances where it is more of a strategic or a growth objective, there are still risk factors in that that you, know, that, that you have to take into account. So include those as, as your outcome. The other side of it is maybe you do just want to look at increased productivity because you know by increasing that productivity, you're going to have business gains out of that. And so one of the areas that you might look at is, you know, are you able to go deeper with your data? If you're able to, you know, improve the amount of time it takes to build a forecast and not have to, um, you know, uh, uh, spend a week on it, but you can spend hours on it, well, what does that do? That opens you up to being able to, you know, take a look at other angles and other factors that are influencing your forecast and even revisioning those forecast models to be much more accurate. And then lastly, there's, you know, things like you know you want to have better capabilities. It's, it's, it's a new, you know, it's sort of a green field. Um, you know, you want to introduce something like prescriptive analytics. You haven't quite done that before or had the capabilities to do that before, but that's where the investments are going to come from, and you know that maybe in one area of, of your business you're looking to have those prescriptive analytics tell you, like I'll give you an example, um, Conoco Phillips had, um, you know, done a project where they took a look at um, – where they took a look at, you know, how, how long they could keep a drilling platform going. And in that scenario, by using prescriptive analytics, they were able to extend their, their, um, uh, their platform drilling time from three to four months. Well, they didn't know that they were going to be able to do that. They didn't know the amount of time that they were going to be ex able to extend that period. And certainly that converts into the amount of additional revenue that they could probably have. But they knew intuitively that if they could incorporate better analytic capabilities, which meant that they had to, have, you know, do wider sourcing of information to have more accurate and a more accurate understanding of what would affect the expansion of that, that drilling time period that, you know, certainly extending their, their um, capabilities was going to do that and that scaling intelligence. So those are some business outcome things that you can kind of take a look at. Um, and then where are the metrics to track on this? Now, obviously, you're going to see things here that are slightly different that maybe you would look at a total cost of ownership model. You can, you know, incorporate things like what is the amount of data used. If you're not putting all of your data to use or a significant portion of your data, data to use, why are you holding on to it? Why are you managing that information? What is the cost associated to doing that? Or what is the, the um, potential impact of not using that information and flying your business blind? Um, so, you know, take into account that percentage and, and really understand um, if, if you're putting all your data to work for you. The second thing is how long does it take to understand 
that information. You know, when you're working on, on greater volumes of data, you're oftentimes having to look at it through different lenses. You're looking at different um, uh, uh, sources of data independently. You're, you know, focusing in on those, you know, as you're bringing some of those sources together. And that can take a long time, especially if you're trying to write a lot of SQL and Python scripts to start, you know, moving through that information. Um, so how, how long is that taking? Or how long does it take because you're waiting on resources to support your business analysts to get them the data that they need? That's incorporated into that time to understanding as well. And time to understanding isn't necessarily time to first value, but it is a, it is a facet that you want to be, want to be including because it is, a, it is a portion of that. Data lake adoption. How many data lakes are sitting out there? Or how many have you stood up? and they're just not really being used, or is only one person using it in a small area of your, your organization? Have you developed a lot of pilots, but they're not getting a lot of traction? Again, take a look at what that is and how long it takes to, you know, from the, the, time, um, the time to implement to the time that it's ready for production to the time when you see um, not just a first use adoption, but that it is being incorporated into your over data and analytics um, you know, uh, capabilities across the organization. Um, so, you know, really define adoption not because you could get a pilot going or you've got a single user or it's developing only one type of, um, one type of analysis, but how much further can that go? Um, how are you increasing and decreasing resources? I mean, this is typically core to any type of, um, you know, cost management model or ROI model, but really think beyond um, just your IT resources and, and how you're using those at, at a data engineering level or, or within your data center. Look across your organization. You know, there, there is a pipeline and a life cycle of how data is brought into your environment and then moves forward to the point where the data is actually being used. Oftentimes we forget that just because you make a, a warehouse or a Hadoop environment or a cloud environment available to your business users, that your work's done, and all you have to do is just start accessing it. But there's often a significant amount of work and effort and, and resources that are required to take data through that last mile. And that's oftentimes where the bottlenecks and the decrease in business value from your data is occurring. Um, oftentimes we look at our governance teams to try to improve upon those, and again, they apply you know, the, the what are our, your data policies, what are your standards that you're going to use, what's the business logic around there, the business rules that go into the data, and defining it across, you know, data quality, dimensions, life cycle dimensions, and so on. But oftentimes, data governance teams can't keep up with the speed of both the uh, volumes of information, the variety of information that's coming into the organization, as well as the volume and variety of data uh, requirements and requests or insight needs that are being accounted for. Um, so certainly governance teams and stewardship stewards are there to, you know, begin and support those, um, those efforts, but it doesn't scale. So really look wide and see how you're delivering, you know, complete end-to-end -end data capabilities. And that certainly goes into this responsiveness because everything changes. Um, you know, if you look at competitive disruption in most markets today, it's happening quickly. It's happening, you know, we, you could say markets kind of mature within a five to seven year period and oftentimes that's, you know, being shrunk, um, you know, it, it, within a two to three year period where you see massive changes and our business stakeholders have to respond to those. If you look at the way that businesses are, are reporting on themselves and where Wall Street is putting pressure to, you know, have a clear understanding and transparency around what business decisions and business actions are being taken, it's, you know, certainly there's the quarterly reports that are going on, but there is a lot more scrutiny that's happening on a week-to-week, month-to-month basis, and so that puts more pressure on organizations to be highly responsive, highly agile, highly uh, flexible to meet those changing dynamics. Um, and then lastly, you know, look at the retirement, uh, you know, the opportunity to retire or decrease a technology service. 
simplify those environments. Just as you're modernizing, look at ways that you're not, you know, introducing or over complicating what you're putting into place. It still needs to be managed. You still need to have skills there. And just a replacement of skills for a new technology isn't necessarily saving you. And in fact, it could even cost more because some of those skills are highly sought after and not many people may have them. So really look at the full investment that's being made in how you're supporting technologies within your organization, even as you modernize. So one way, you know, so putting this into context, we can look at what an auditing firm, uh, you know, for an example, at an auditing firm, um, they take a look at, um, you, know, over, you know, over thousands of analysts that spend a lot of time sort of cleaning, organizing, merging, really munging through a lot of information to complete their audits. And the challenge here was they spend so much of their time trying to get to the, the basic information for an audit, sometimes they can't really go deeper. And, you know, why does that become a problem is because if you can start offloading some of the time that they're spending to do the cleansing, you can actually increase the, the revenue capacity to 27%. And why is that the case? Because they are able to go deeper. They're able to profile. They're actually able to perform, you know, deeper analytics that can identify areas that are, you know, are at risk for organizations and, and they can, um, you know, extend their service offers from that, from that perspective. So that's one way of kind of looking at what you can do to, um, you know, build a, an ROI case. Now, that being said, um, at Paxata, what we've done is built, um, you know, sort of a, a rudimentary calculator to help you get started. And, and uh, again, this is by no means incorporating all of the different facets that you might want to put into an ROI calculation, but at least it can give you a foundational baseline and you can add additional um, additional aspects that, that make it more relevant to your organization. What you'll notice in the ROI calculator is two things. One, it's divided between what's happening within the IT organization, but also what's happening within the business and the business analyst community. Why is that important? Again, because ROI has to take into account both sides of your, in a holistic perspective, of your organization and the way that it manages data. And as I talked about before, it really is that end-to-end -end model from bringing data in to the end point of where that data is being used and value is being received. So really what we've done is we looked at, you know, a, a few things. But certainly the number of people that are being, you know, um, you know, that are supporting these types of capabilities, looking at their hourly rates, and really understanding how much time it's taking them to prepare data or munch through that information. Doing that on the other side, again, for the business analyst community. So basically what we're doing is looking at sort of time and resource factors here and understanding the cost that goes into it, and then taking a look at also is an analytic project directly associated to revenue generation. And this is kind of important because this kind of balances back out the fact of, you know, are you trying to contribute to more of that upside of your organization or are you trying to de-risk? And so we can take that into account and then you can put into, in, into place anticipated, um, you know, contributions of revenue. And, and being conservative. So a lot of the numbers that you're seeing I just put in um, are, are fairly conservative numbers um, at, you know, that, that I could see at a company and, and certainly depending on your regions, it's going to change a little bit, particularly around, you know, your hourly pay rates and do you account for that if it's fully loaded or not or things of that nature or, you know, a conservative figure of what an, you know, a, a, a analytic project will do to, to generate revenue. But what you could start seeing here is it's calculating out the technical and non-technical resources, the number of hours that's being put into this, you know, over the course of a year and the annual cost that's associated to the work that's being done. So this starts to give you a little bit of a baseline in terms of resources and what does that translate into? Well, let's take a look at these headcounts. You can start to see, um, you know, in, in, in environments where you're using Paxata to prepare the data. So, and, and really what does that incorporate? That incorporates people that are self-service enabled to access the 
their um, their personal data, that which may reside, you know, in spreadsheets on their um, on their desktop, proprietary information, which is you know data and information that is um, within the the organization, public information that sits outside, as well as premium information that might come from places like Dun and Bradstreet or Bloomberg's or some other type of um, industry um, industry source that is, is selling um, data service or any IIS uh, type of environment. And so comparing that self-service capability to access, prepare that information and then make it available and publishing that out for, you know, analytics or operational types of use cases to what happens in a traditional type of pipeline development where, you know, data engineers are building um, you know, data marts and uh, uh, data integration pipelines to land information that could, you could put some analytic tool on top of, but also taking into account maybe it's not fully prepared in the context of how those users are, are doing that. And so what you look at is sort of this recovery of, you know, having Paxata in place and helping in those areas in, in the model for what I put in, it could actually um, – you know, save you equivalent of 16 man years or approximately, um, you know, one point, what is it, one point six? Sorry, it's a little small over there. But you can see where the cost savings kind of come in there um, in terms of, you know, creating more efficiency with your, with your, um, with your uh, uh, employee resources. Now, next, how can you add resources? We're always kind of taking a look at, like, where can you free – free up resources, but also, you know, where can you find additional resources to do other things? And in the same context, looking at, you know, using Paxata versus, versus traditional methods. Um, you know, with Paxata, you can actually realize a 31% 30, um, increased headcount availability. And what does that mean? It means that those hours that were spent doing, you know, more technical work or waiting for information or doing a lot of manual efforts where Paxat is starting to assist in that data preparation, you can, um, you know, th those resources can either be applied to go deeper on the types of things that they're doing or take on more types of analytics or initiatives within, within their organization. And, and really what that tells you is in, in your ROI model as you identify where resources are freed up, account for the fact of where those resources can be reallocated to either take on other projects that have new ROI or new, you know, contributions to the business or where they're helping out, um, you know, in, in, um, in just making um, things better. So that's, you know, another factor that can go into your overall return on investment. Sorry, I just want to make sure. And then lastly, you get back into productivity. How productive is your team? How much more can they take on? Where does capacity come in? And where does that contribute to, to some of the number of the existing projects where you are going deeper? And in this perspective, it, you know, the capacity has increased 23%. So, you know, you, you get a little bit of an idea at this point about how even three basic areas in terms of um, you know, productivity, added resources, or the number of resource hours can actually be incorporated not into a baseline ROI model, but you can start linking these out to other types of capabilities and initiatives and projects that you have in place. And so, you know, just to kind of sum this up, you know, as we've had, you know, conversations with some of our customers, I think this is the quote that I've always really liked. Um, from one of the chief data officers at a, at a large financial services firm, a, a banking and credit card firm, said, you know, prior to Paxata, we struggled with cumbersome data prep processes that were impossible for us to audit or automate. And our only approach was to just throw more bodies at the problem. And I think that that is pretty typical of what you've seen in most organizations, and that even in many of the self-service environments, there's still a lot of coding that needs to be done. There's still a lot of heavy lifting that needs to be done by those business analysts and even the data science community. And I think what Pexata is really trying to introduce is a way to, to improve upon that and make those, um, those analysts and, and um, business stakeholders much more um, uh, productive in, in the way that they handle data and, and, you know, create a relationship with their data too. So how, do, how does Paxata look at this? Well, we look at it in three ways. First of all, we take into account that there really are three primary stakeholders that um, are focused on creating, you know, great data 
for the organization. And that's your obviously your business analyst, the one who's actually, you know, building the insights. Um, and what do they want to do? They want to engage with the data themselves because that's helping them do their jobs, do their jobs better, and do their jobs um, faster. And it, for every question that comes up or every, um, you know, uh, assumption or hypothesis that is being made, they don't always know exactly or can't exactly articulate the way that the data should be, but they know when they're looking at it and they know when they can interact with the data when data looks great. Now, they're working for the heads of analytics or a digital analytic officer or sometimes you're hearing the term chief analytics officer coming up and these are the people in your organization who are thinking bigger. They're thinking about how do I build insights and how do I use insights to be an insight-driven um, business. And so they're building these, these um, centralized as well as decentralized competency centers to democratize insight and, you know, they really want to power the business. And so what they're really addressed to is, you know, how do you deliver meaningful information to drive your business outcomes? And where Paxata is helping them is to provide a unified platform that any business analyst or, or business, um, business user can use to access, prepare, and publish, you know, data um, to the business but at the same time give them independence about what are the analytic tools that they want to use. You know, do they, are they using R, are they using SAS or, S, or SPSS, are they using Tableau or Click, or are they, you know, working within a, a BI environment like a Cognos or a business object. And in those scenarios, there's still a lot of freedom to operate within the analytic and business applications that they're used to, but they have a unified and collaborative platform where each can harness um, each other's works and collaborate and ensure that they're building upon, you know, upon the tribal knowledge of each other to bring forth the information that, that um, you know, makes the business better. And in the end, there's also your chief data officer that, you know, there's been a lot written up on chief data officers and where they come and how they're effective. But at the end of the day, they're really the, the stewards of the information to say, I want to ensure the organization is enabled to get the most value out of their data and do that at scale. So they're really responsible for a lot of the modernization, not only of the, of the uh, data systems, but also around the operational processes to ensure that the business gets the most value from their data. And they often work very closely with the chief analytics officer and the enterprise or information architecture teams and the data engineers that are developing the environments that the analysts and the analytics teams are going to use. And so Paxata really is trying to serve these three um, customers by providing an application environment that is user-friendly, intuitive, visual and flexible for what a business analyst needs, provides a platform that a chief analytics officer can, you know, have anybody on her team use and collaborate with, and then the chief data officer that can really get the most out of the Paxata, you know, as a platform to serve a lot of the, um, you know, the, the broader business needs and data services and pipelines that an organization requires. And so the, the Paxata business information platform is really um, you know, designed to address, you know, uh, needs around data that have, are supported maybe at an infrastructure level for scale within the IT organization, but also um, at scale and repeatable for the business organization. Um, and at the same time, anything that's happening from the individual business analysts and the analyst community where they're imparting, you know, a lot of um, iterative, uh, iterative exploration and discovery within, um, you know, with the data, doing ad hoc types of, of, um, of analysis, that that is captured and can be put into a repeatable scalable type of environment. So really what Paxata is doing is allowing data be, to be prepared by the business and being scaled for the business. So it's enterprise grade and it's business grade. And what does the architecture look like? We really see it in um, a variety of layers. Certainly, you know, taking into account first 
who is going to use this this um, environment from developers to data scientists to analysts to the general information worker. We really design the system as an application, having an application that is relevant to the types of use cases where the platform will be used. So it could be BI and analytics, but certainly supporting some of the transactional um, uh, requirements, data marts, data as a service, and other types of custom apps that come into place. And then at the core is really where the platform excels with all of the comprehensive um, capabilities that you would expect within an information management environment, integration, quality, enrichment, governance, and collaboration with the security and administration that goes along with this. And really the secret sauce is around the intelligence and semantic cataloging and library that, uh, that is available within the, um, the system to both apply and prepare the data so that it's, it's contextually appropriate, as well as take in, um, you know, the, the subject matter expertise of the, um, of the analysts and the data scientists as they're imparting, um, you know, the business nomenclature and context back in. We automate that. We have a connectivity framework that allows you to, with out-of-the-box connectors, just ingest information, prepare that information, and then push that back out um, into repeatable services, setting those up as pipelines and scheduling those. And in fact, some of that can actually be done by the business analysts themselves, so it's continuously refreshing the answer sets. And then really the, the ultimate secret sauce is the fact that we are a Spark application and Spark architecture. We don't just run on Spark. We have a fully integrated um, capability where we are able to, you know, granularly manage um, Spark to account for a wide variety of performance requirements, either in batch, micro batch, or more real time to create the most interactive, responsive um, system as you're preparing your data and maintaining that data in a persistent state, state as well as we sit on top of a Hadoop environment and making that available in any type of environment, whether that's traditional big data like Hadoop environments, cloud, on-premise, or hybrid types of scenarios. So with that, um, some key takeaways when you're thinking about building your ROI model account for the fact that it should be it should be tuned to at least one of these four capabilities on the upside and the risk factors for strategic growth efficiency and risk metrics you want to look at metrics that account for accessibility interaction accountability and time to value so take a look at the um, at the uh, quadrant that I showed you um, earlier in the deck Account for the fact that business outcomes are personal, operational, and organizational, that your outcomes are going to um, affect different areas of your organization, which means that the ROI um, foundation is going to be sli slightly different. So if they're more operational, it could be down in an IT total cost of ownership. If it's personal, it's the um, productivity and effectiveness that you're getting out of your workforce. And if it's organizational, it's linking back up into the broader strategic growth, efficiency, and risk factors that you take a look at. And then lastly, build an information platform that translates the tribal knowledge into organizational IP. One of the biggest challenges I think that we have today in how we've traditionally managed information is thinking that we can know all of our requirements up front, that everything can be pre-built, and we are just operating too quickly as a business with the volumes of information coming in and the variety of information coming into our organization or that's available to us really puts too much strain and pressure on our existing um, information management practices, and we really need to look at new ways and methods to support um, how we get the most out of our data, the, the highest value out of our data, and that requires that we think about more of a citizenship model where, where information isn't just democratized, but the ability to manage, be responsible, and accountable for that information is also a democratized experience. So with that, I just want to thank you for taking the time today and, and joining us for our presentation on, on the, you know, how you can calculate the cost of data. Certainly um, come to our website and schedule a free demo. We would love to be able to share with you the Paxata experience and the business information platform and what you can get out of it. 
And with that, if I can open it up within the last six or seven minutes and see if there are any questions that I can answer. Hi, Michelle. Thank you so much for this fantastic presentation. We certainly have questions coming in. Of course, one of the most popular questions that we receive are questions about receiving the slides. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording of the session, along with anything else requested throughout. Um, so just getting down to it, um, you know, the, um, when you were asking what are the biggest challenges when uh, preparing data, a comment came through saying business users not understanding the business or business process. Do you want to make any comment to that? Um, so let me see if I, I understand this. So one of the biggest challenges is that the business users don't understand the process. Like how do they go about um, right. preparing their data? Is that it? Okay. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, so there's two sides to that. There's how well have you communicated and trained the organization to know how they can get access to their data, what resources are available to them, who they should contact, and so on. In large organizations, that's, that's certainly an effort. And your governance team should really be thinking about how to, how to do that um, and what are the support systems out there, what's the hotline that they can call or, or email to, or you know, if you've got some sort of a task management system leveraging that. Um, you know, set up Slack. That's what we do. We have Slack. <laughs> so anything happens, somebody's like, you know, somebody's out there. Um, but on the other hand, if it is a bottleneck, I think you also have to question what don't you understand in the way that your business users and analysts want to interact with the data or what are their needs and, and requirements to access it and really balancing an understanding of when they're too shady in terms of, and I use that term loosely, but too shady in the way that they know what they want to immediately get out of it versus they have hard requirements. And, you know, I say that there's really this 80-20 rule out there today where 80% of the time that a business user or a business analyst wants the data, they have a general understanding about what they're trying to figure out, but they don't know the exact questions. They don't know the exact um, data elements that they want to incorporate. They may or may not have an idea about the exact data sources that they require. And so I think organizations really have to consider how to adopt capabilities for this more fluid, iterative discovery process in the hands of those that are less technical versus, you know, um, what we've done with data scientists, which is really give them the keys to access what they need and they're coding and scripting and they're, they're fairly technical in and of themselves. But I think that same um, self-service requirement is, is necessary for your, um, your business analysts and end users as well. Sure, and we just have a few more minutes, so let me see if I can sneak in a couple more questions here. Uh, do you have an example of data cost ROI from a manufacturing business? Ooh, I will need to get back to you on that. I think, you know, one that comes to mind, and this isn't, and honestly, this is coming a little bit more from my Forester days rather than my Paxpada days, although I, I'm sure we have something um, we could probably provide in that, in that realm too, but I thought it was really interesting, a conversation that I had with L'Oreal, where they were looking at um, master data information as it related to their production lines. And they under, because of the automation and the data use in the production lines, um, if the master data wasn't accurate, it could cause issues in, in um, the, the ability to create the cosmetics or, and, and so on. And so they were really linking up you know, what the information needed to look like um, at different points within the, the production processes so that their um, production lines didn't go down. Um, and, and that, you know, to be honest, that was done a little bit more in sort of the old style MDM, you know, requirements, standards, policies, uh, a type of framework, governance framework that, that was done before. But I think where data preparation capabilities start coming into play today is that you can be much more agile in doing that because you can have the business users who really own that data, even, you know, the, 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 um, the product managers or the merchandisers who own that information and have all of that 
that product data available, immediately go in and, and with a data preparation tool, look at the data that is feeding the plant line, and then coming back out and, and being able to, to rapidly change and update that information and immediately deploy. So there's, you know, you shorten the SDLC time to making those changes, you know, kind of do a little bit of a runaround on, on the traditional um, MDM capability, but you do it faster and at a lower cost, and you start opening up your lines a lot, a lot, um, you know, a, a lot more than you would. Um, so that that was one of the things that they did, and they they definitely had re they had a significant reduction in um, uh, production, you know, production line downtime once they started putting those things into place. And like I said, that that's pre sort of data preparation, but you can see how the two could actually kind of come together, and they could, you know have a, a better um, a better outcome with newer capabilities. Well, that brings us right up to the top of the hour. Michelle, thank you so much for this great presentation. Um, just to, again, to remind everyone, we will be publishing the recorded webinar on slides2daydiversity.net within two business days, and I'll send a follow-up email so by end of day Thursday with uh, links and other requested information. And thank you again to Paxada for sponsoring today's webinar, as always. Uh, a big thank you to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do and for your great questions. We just love it. So I hope everyone has a great day. Enjoy. Again, Michelle, thank you so much. This was great. Great. Thank you, too. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice afternoon.